Hello, yes. Uh, am I through to Holesworthy Congregation? Speaking. Oh, great. Thank you. Uh, I was given a copy of your book, Enjoy Life Forever, which I've been reading. Um, oh, right. found it rather interesting. Um, oh, that's great. Um, when I went to church, which was many years ago, I did, however, notice some of the teachings are, are a little different. Right. Um, c could, you, could you help, if that's possible, please? Um, yeah. Yeah, less are, you, are you in are you in Holsworthy? No, I'm slightly to the west of Holsworthy. Okay. Yeah. Um, I no don't problem. have transport. Um I rely on public pub, public services. Um what? lesson lesson 15. Um paragraph oh, right, okay. Yeah, lesson 15. I I've gone some way through the book. Lesson 15 paragraph 3 on page 63. It says after Jesus's life as a human ended, he was resurrected as a spirit and he returned to heaven. There God exalted him to a superior position. Now Jesus has a position of great authority second only to Jehovah himself. Well, I certainly believe that Jesus um, was born of a virgin. He lived a sinless life. He died. I believe he resurrected. Uh, I believe he ascended to heaven. Acts 1, uh, 8 to 10. But I can't accept that he was resurrected as a spirit, which is what your book says. That kind of really puzzled me, that, that comment. Okay. So what was your, would your understanding have been that he was resurrected in physical form? Yes, yes, yes. I, I mean, um, when he appeared to his disciples, um, it said that um, he, he ate a piece of broiled fish. Uh, and, um, right, yeah. Um, at Luke, Luke 24, 39... Behold my hands and my feet. Well, obviously, because they have the marks of crucifixion in them. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and yeah. see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you say I have. So he, he's saying very clearly he's not a spirit. He, he's appearing before them in a body of flesh and bones. Verse 40, when yeah. he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled he said to them have you any food here so they gave him a piece of broiled fish uh, my bible says on some honeycomb but that's not in some of the older more reliable texts right. and he took it and ate it in their presence so he says it's i myself twice he he's insisting they look at his hands and his feet well why his hands and feet were special because they had the marks of crucifixion in them and he says, a yeah. spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. So surely he resurrected in the same body that died upon the tree, which is why he says it's I myself. And why he says to them, handle me and see. Yeah, no, I totally understand where you're coming from. Mm. So so definitely from those verses that you, you've rightly um, quoted, that definitely we can say that, Jesus, post-resurrection, he definitely did have uh, a physical body. The question is, did that was that physical body um, the thing that was used to be resurrected then to heaven? Could, could that be a fair question? Um, is what you're saying Orthodox Jehovah's Witness doctrine? I, I've been looking at your insight in the scripture book. Uh, yeah. your book seems to imply that he rose as a spirit he resurrected as a spirit that's what your book says yeah so de so i'll tell you what if you have you got your bible there with you yes yes sure yes yeah and is it the king james version or another this is the new king james version okay so if you turn to first peter three First Peter three, eighteen. Yeah. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. And then in verse nineteen, by whom 
he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared. Um, it says in my Bible, he's made alive by the Holy Spirit. There's no Bible that I know of that says he's made alive as a spirit. I think most of the modern Bibles uh, would read here because I believe that um, it, the case in Greek is dative, which is movement. So it contrasts being put to death in flesh, made alive in spirit, because they're both in the same case, which is dative. And then the next verse, by whom he went and preached to the spirits in prison. So it was through his human spirit that he went and, and preached to the spirits who were in prison. Now, who those are is rather complicated. Is it the... Um, the fallen angels or is it the um, righteous right, righteous dead or um, awaiting the resurrection or is it the wicked dead there's lots of different interpretations of that verse but no the, um, first peter 318 in no bible says he's made alive as a spirit so if it says it's made alive in the spirit mm -hmm. then it would, would would you you would sort of read that as exclusively talking about the power of the spirit. Well, there's there's two interpretations. One is he's put to death in his flesh, but made alive by the spirit, meaning meaning by the Holy Spirit. The second interpretation right. is to focus on the two datives, put to death in flesh, dative, made alive in spirit, dative. What you must understand is that as as, as I understand, I don't go to church anymore, but when I when I did. Um, Christians believe that Jesus Christ, in his deity, has always been spirit. He's never, there was never a time when Jesus was not spirit. O okay, in his deity, he is spirit. The same spirit as the Father and the Holy Spirit, although as persons they are eternally and personally distinct. Um, right. With yeah. regard to Christ's human nature, which makes it a little bit more complicated... <laughs> OK, his human nature was created just over 2000 years ago in Mary's womb. That would not just include his flesh, but that would also include a human spirit. If, if Christ didn't have a human spirit or soul, then he wouldn't have been fully human. If he wasn't fully human, he couldn't atone for our sins. Yeah, this is oh, an yeah. extremely complicated verse, but th there's two interpretations. Either he's put to death in the flesh and made alive by the Spirit, so the Holy Spirit brings him back to life. That's one interpretation. The other interpretation is it says he's put to death in flesh, made alive in spirit, um, which would right. be a reference to his human spirit that then goes in the next verse to pr proclaim victory to the spirits in prison, whoever those are, which is another very complicated issue. But no right. Bible verse okay. says he's, he's made that. alive as a spirit because Christ has eternally right. been spirit in his deity he is eternally spirit John 1 1 who's eternally with the father so Christ right. couldn't okay. have Christ couldn't have become a spirit as his resurrection because in his deity he he always has been a spirit you see right I, I see yeah I can see where you're coming from I, I suppose that the thing is for, for us you know when we when we look at, at those scriptures and it's talking about, you know, as we've, as we've said, he's talking about being made, put to death in the flesh. So he's been put to death as a human. He, he, is, he was killed, so he died mm -hmm. and he needed, to then, he needed to then be resurrected. And so for, for us... The, when the scriptures talk about him having a physical body, the, the very simple and obvious solution for, for us would be that, you know, we know that spirit creatures can materialize. And so when he was able to eat a meal, of course, that would have been with a physical body. But then when he went to heaven, we would say that then he didn't have a physical body to take to heaven. Because, well, flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom, as First Corinthians fifteen fifty says. 
Um, so, you know, we know that heaven is not a physical place. Does, does that make sense? Not really, no. No? Not really, is no. It possible, is it possible, yeah. from, from your understanding, is it possible for your, I, physical I, humans to... I think what you're doing is you're, you're, you're really reading something into First Peter 3 that's not there. It doesn't say he's made alive as a spirit. Because you're reading that verse that all of a sudden Christ becomes a spirit. The text doesn't say that. It doesn't say he's made alive as a spirit. No English Bible reads that way. And I've looked at the New World Translation and that doesn't read that way either. It's either yeah, no, he's it's, made alive in, in the spirit. In the Spirit. So he's either made alive by the Holy Spirit, as some Bibles read, not just the King James and the New King James, a couple of other versions. Or it's a contrast between in flesh, in spirit. So Christ has a hu human flesh, but he also has human spirit. And so it would be a reference to, to both of those. And in his, uh, in his human spirit, he goes and preaches his victory, proclaims his victory, to the spirits in prison in the next in the next verse but no verse says christ becomes he's made alive he becomes a spirit at his at his at his resurrection that's that's not what the text actually says um would you would you agree that a man has flesh a reference in the bible to men or man man is anthropos yeah. in greek yeah um because post resurrection Christ is called a man. Uh, if, if you look at Timothy, Paul's, Paul's letter to Timothy, now that's sometime in the AD 60s. I, I'm, I'm not a biblical expert, so I can't give you the exact date, but sometime around AD 60, maybe AD 65. Yeah. That's about 30 years after Christ's death, burial and resurrection. Uh. In verse... Uh, chapter 2, verse 4, and I was corrected by a very clever lady over this, because she told me that the verbs come from verse 4. Um, notice that it refers to Christ in about AD 60 as the man Christ Jesus. Man is anthropos in Greek. And it's sorry, what, in the... What, um, did you say that was... Um, which book for, was that, sorry? Yep, yeah, 1 Timothy, chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Oh, Sorry, I was in second Timothy. No, Sorry. no. Um, so it says, who desires all men to be saved, present tense, and to come to the knowledge of the truth, present tense. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, still all present tense, the man Christ okay. Jesus. So it's saying in the present tense that, that Christ when Paul is writing to Timothy, he is the man Christ Jesus. Now, this is 30 years, roughly, after his ascension into heaven. But he's still called the man Christ Jesus. Right. So... Well, if he's a man, he has a human body. You, you just um, agreed to that. You said a man cannot be a man without a human body. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Christ is called yeah. the man, that's Anthropos in Greek, Christ Jesus in 1 Timothy 2.5. Uh, yeah. No, I, I understand what you're saying. Yeah. So, you know, if when Jesus was re resurrected then, he was resurrected exactly as he was before. So just, just the same as like Lazarus, you know, Lazarus died and then Jesus brought him back to life and he was exactly the same as when he died. Christ resurrected in the very same body that he died in, that, he, that, that, that died upon the tree. However, um, when he resurrected from the dead, he, he resurrected in the same body, but it's a glorified human body. It has some, I don't know, some supernatural aspects to it that we, we don't have at, at the present time, but at Christ's return, which hasn't happened yet, at the resurrection of the dead, those who rise in Christ will rise in the same body that they die in, but somehow it's going to be a glorified human body. It will have some 
some some aspects that whilst it's the same body um, I guess it won't age I guess it won't sit be sick maybe we'll be able to jump higher uh, maybe our sight will be you know much better like an eagle's sight maybe we'll be able to swim for two hours underwater maybe that body it'll be the same body but it's going to be improved right okay um, so how, how would you explain the, the fact that you know, in at about AD 60 to AD 65, Paul in the present tense refers to Christ as the man Christ Jesus. That would mean to Paul that, that Christ is, is a man in about AD 60. So, let me just look at the, the passage again. Yeah, sure. Because, you know, it, when, when looking at that verse, you know, there is, there is one God, one mediator between God and men. Did you say the man? Yeah. So yeah, man, man is Anthropos. Yeah. The man, other translations might say a man. Well, a, a a man or the man, um, fine, doesn't really matter. Yeah. But it means that Christ is a human so, being, you see. So according to Paul, Paul's writing in the present tense, and somebody a lot cleverer than me collect, uh, corrected me that the grammar comes from verse 4, not from verse 5. Um, Paul, in, in 30 years after the resurrection, refers to Christ as a man. He doesn't say yeah. he was a man. He is, present tense, the man Christ Jesus. And if I could go to another verse, um, Luke. Luke refers to um, uh, Paul's, Paul's comments on Mars, Mars Hill. I've actually been to Mars Hill. I went on a, a trip to Greece once and we went to the Acropolis. It was a... A tour and it wasn't terribly interesting but at the bottom of the Acropolis was Mars Hill so I, I ran down uh, missing the uh, Acropolis part and I actually stood on Mars Hill and I found a little rock on the the ground so I, I picked it up and I took it home so I've got a bit of Mars Mars Hill with me <laughs> <Nice. laughs> um, in in Acts 17 31 um, <clears throat> um, Luke records Paul saying this of Christ because he, that's the father has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he, that's the father has ordained he has, a given, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him, that's Christ from the dead so it says two things. Firstly, the father is going to judge the world by a man. And obviously the judgment hasn't happened yet. This is the judgment at Christ's return at the end of time. And then it says he's given assurance of this judgment by raising him from the dead. Now, the antecedent for him is, is man in the verse, Acts 17, uh. Acts 17, 31. So it says two things. It, it says that. Christ was risen from the dead as a man but secondly it says that the future judgment will be by the man obviously by Christ who at the still still to come judgment which hasn't happened yet Christ is going to judge the world not as a spirit creature but as a man to me it's fairly emphatic right yeah uh, yeah I, I understand I understand what you say the the thing that the thing, the, perhaps the biggest thing for for for, for me and for, for us as um, as an organisation is is that we you know we don't feel that the the idea that Jesus is God is true. Um, we we really feel that God and Jesus, so God has a name and his name is Jehovah or Yahweh, as many people 
prefer, um, and and that Jesus is separate from the Father, and so. You maybe, think I'm a modalist. You sorry. You obviously think that I'm a modalist. I'm not. I'm a Trinitarian. What's a modalist? Modalist is somebody who believes that God is one person. So when Jesus is praying to the Father, he's praying to himself, because the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all the same one person. That's modalism. Condemned at the Council of Constantinople in 381 in the first point. Viciously condemned as absolute heresy. Right. So Trinitarians know, don't believe in modalism. That. I'm not a modalist. I don't believe that Jesus, when he's praying to the Father, he's praying to himself because he is the Father. That's absolutely ridiculous and that's not what trinitarians believe we believe the father the son and the holy spirit are the same one god same one being with same one spirit they share the same essence which is spirit however mm -hmm. within the nature of god we believe that there is a, an eternal persons. distinction you use the word separate we wouldn't use the word separate we'd say that there is an eternal distinction between the father and the son and the holy spirit so Father and Son and Holy Spirit are each personal. They're each distinct, distinct from the other. They're eternally yeah. distinct and they're personally and eternally distinct. What we mean by that is that the Father is a he, not an it. The Son is a he, not an it. The Holy Spirit yeah. is a he, not an it. And they are distinct, they're personal, and they're eternally personally distinct. But that's really a separate issue, which I'd be happy to go into some other time. But... Um, could I just refer yeah. to that other verse that you, you commented upon, 1 Corinthians 15? Yeah. I think it was 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty. I think you... Do you want to go over your point again? What what was your point there? Um, so, I think that was just talking about... That, oh, yeah, it says... So, uh, let me pull up the, uh, the other version. Yeah, that the flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Right. Um, if and so, yeah. when, we, when we talk about the kingdom of God, then it's talking about heaven which is where god's kingdom is and so when we're talking about heaven we're not talking about the physical realm um well i'd say that the kingdom of god is the rule of god and the rule of god is wherever um christ is is ruling so, yes, Christ is presently in heaven and he's ruling from heaven, heaven being defined as um, somewhere that is immaterial outside of our um, three dimensions plus, plus time. So um, that would be my definition of the kingdom of God. It's the rule of God. And of course, the, the purpose of the church here is not to sing clappy songs or to build buildings the point of the church is to proclaim Christ's victory over the devil, the coming judgment, and to call people, men and women and children, to repentance and to be a part of this kingdom and to uplift Christ. So that, that to me, is the purpose of the kingdom of God. Um, you haven't read the whole verse. You've totally missed the context by ignoring the end, which says, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. I'll read the whole verse. But if you think about it, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. What this verse is saying is that people who sort of die hating Christ, think of Hitler in his bunker. OK, uh, the Russians are closing in. So what does he do? He's always hated Christ. He hates the gospel. He's murdered millions and millions of people. Hitler kills himself. Now, Hitler never receive salvation he never had his sins forgiven so what this verse this passage is saying and i'll read from verse 50 to 54 is that people like hitler who die in their sins i.e they have corruption sin they're not going to inherit the kingdom of god because only the people who 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 become in who 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 lose this corruption when they come to christ 
and, and they, they're given salvation, only these people without corruption, only they're going to inherit the kingdom of God, which will be the eternal rule of, rule of, rule of Christ. Does, does that make sense before I read the passage? But in verse 53, so it's talking about, it says, flesh and blood cannot inherit God's kingdom, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. And then 53 says that this which is, is corruptible, mm -hmm. so this, this being what? Being flesh. Flesh. That's, that's why we age. I, I've got white hair, I've lost some of my teeth, I'm old, yeah. I'm slowing down. <laughs> so, yeah. so, so and then which, one day I and, and one day I will I, I will die because our physical bodies, despite what the extreme Pentecostals say, our physical bodies are under the curse of sin. So you can do all the tongue talking you like or you can go yeah. to Christian science meetings, okay? You're gonna eventually age and die, no matter what the extreme i don't want to blame all pentecostals but the extreme lunatic um tv preachers like kenneth copeland and benny hinn you know um they don't quite understand that our bodies our physical bodies are under the curse of sin when we come to christ yeah. at the present time it's our souls that are saved it's the complete opposite of genesis okay um our souls are saved when we come to Christ and we repent of our sins, but not our physical bodies, which is why our bodies age and die. Our bodies will be redeemed, they will be saved at Christ's second coming, when they'll be risen up from the grave, or if we're still alive, then they will be changed in a twinkling of an eye, they will become glorified human bodies, which means they'll be physical bodies that are totally free from sin. So the present time, it, it, it's, it's, very, it's very strange because in Genesis, we read in Genesis, um, the warning from God, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. So don't eat of the fruit of the tree. Yeah. Uh, right, Genesis two sixteen and 17. And the Lord God commanded man, the man saying, of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now, whether the tree is a literal tree or whether it's symbolic of something else, I'm not going to go down that route. But the text is very clear. The day you eat of the tree, you're going to die. Mm -hmm. Adam and Eve ate of the tree and they lived for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. Right? Is that a contradiction in the Bible? Death there is applied immediately to the death of the soul the spirit or the soul. The body also came under the condemnation, but whereas the, the soul or the spirit was damned the very instant that they broke God's command, whether that's taken literal or not is a secondary issue, the body died centuries later. You got it? So it, it's applied in two parts. You oh, break so God's law, you become a sinner, your soul is damned immediately. Your soul or your spirit, they're interchangeable. Unless you happen to be an American dispensationalist. Okay, as many evangelicals are. Um, so for, 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 me, for me, you know, looking at that verse, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't need to be a contradiction for when it says, you know, for in the day you eat from it, you will certainly die. But they didn't you know, die. Just, for, until hundreds of years later yeah well we know that to god time is different from humans so there's um there's a, a verse that says that for, for a thousand no, years is like a day no i don't think you can use that verse in peter and apply it back into genesis they died well, they back, died they, they died spiritually the moment they broke god's command but physical death happens centuries later. When it comes to the salvation of the soul, it's our soul or our spirit that is saved when we come to Christ. That also happens instantly. But the promised redemption of the body and, you know, the extreme TV preachers who claim that, you know, there's healing power in the gospel and you can never be sick and never die and never be ill. 
and you're going to have health and wealth and all that sort of stuff. Obviously, it's, it's not true, but that will be true after Christ's return when the body is redeemed because our physical bodies haven't been redeemed at the moment. So just as Adam and Eve, fe the instant they broke God's command, death came upon their soul or spirit, but the body died centuries later. When it comes to the gospel, our souls or our spirits are saved the moment we trust on Christ. But the physical redemption of the body doesn't happen at that time, no matter what Christian science or the extreme Pentecostals will, will tell you. It's going to happen um, whenever Christ returns, whenever that's going, going to be. Do you mind if I read 1 are Corinthians 15? You, are, you still, are, you, are you still in chapter 2 of Genesis? No, uh, but I'll go there if you want. I was going to say, so, because I, I understand what, you, what you're saying from verse 17. It says the day, so we, you know we must we must take that as um, li meaning literally the day, and so we have to apply that to the soul, and then the body died later. That's what I've just but, said. That's what I've just yeah, said. No, and 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 yeah, using yeah. and I using. The... I understand that. Yeah. However, yeah. if you go up to verse four. Of Genesis chapter 2, it says, This is a history of the heavens and the earth. Um, well, these are the generations of the heavens and of the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the heavens and the earth, or the earth and the heavens. So we've got a verse here that is talking about the day. Now, yes. should, should we take that literally? Do we have to take that literally? What would you say? Um, yes, I think the word yom in Hebrew for day um, is taken literally in its in its uses in the first few chapters of Genesis. I don't think there's any indication that a day actually means a thousand years or a day means a million years. Um, what you must understand with Genesis is that it's a very simplified account of the creation story. It's not going into scientific okay. details. It's just giving us a general... And the focus in Genesis, in Genesis is a simplified overview. For instance, I mean, we know, for instance, that the, um, the sun was created before the earth because we get the heavier elements from the sun, you know, like, yeah. like mercury and lead and gold. Um, they, yeah. would, they would come from the fusion, um, the nuclear fusion generation within the sun. Um, but the Bible says that the earth was made before the sun. The sun was created, I think, on the fourth day. All right? You understand that? The reason, the reason for that is probably because throughout um, the Old Testament, pagan groups worshipped the sun as God. And so knowing that, that's why, for spiritual reasons, the order of the creation moves the creation of the sun to the fourth the fourth day so we know no doubt at all about it god is not saying the first thing and the most important thing that was created was the sun and then we have to worship the sun like the pagans do so you i do think you find in the bible things are changed around even in the genealogies you'll find that people are missed out of the gene genealogies and they're they're chopped and changed quite a lot Things like this happen in all spiritual books, but including the Bible, and they're done so for a spiritual reason. Because what Genesis is trying to get across to us is, is, is that God is our creator and nothing should um, dissuade us from, from focusing our worship upon God and God alone, not the Son. Um, so we seem to agree in Genesis 2.17 that it's a spiritual death that happened instant, instantaneously the moment they sinned. But physical death happened later. All I'm saying is the opposite is um, reversed for salvation. Spiritual life comes to us the moment we trust on Christ and he grants us eternal life. But the salvation of the body will be a future event. It's not something that we get at salvation, no matter what Christian science and the 
the extreme Pentecostals tell us. Would you mind if I read 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty to 54? No. So bear in mind that the key phrase is, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. So what this is telling us when I read the passage is that unredeemed people, people who haven't found salvation in Christ, they won't inherit the kingdom of God. It's just common sense, really. People like Hitler, people like Stalin, mass murderers like like those people and Joseph Joseph Mengler who did medical experiments on children in Auschwitz. People like this who died not repenting of their sins and coming to faith in Christ, they have no part in God's kingdom. It's fairly fairly obvious really. It's got nothing to do whatsoever with going to heaven and whether you go to heaven as a spirit or a or a, or in your flesh. So 1 Corinthians 15:50 15, 15, now this I say brethren that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God nor does corruption inherit incorruption there's the context behold I tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall be changed right this is the resurrection in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet so it's definitely the resurrection at Christ's second coming uh, not some um, rapture event uh, which is popular in evangelical circles. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. Okay, so their physical bodies will be raised, but because, because they've been redeemed by Christ, their souls have been redeemed and are, and are with Christ in heaven, their bodies are here on the earth. When they come back with Christ at the second coming to this earth, then their souls or spirit will be reunited with their physical bodies, which would be resurrected, and they will be glorified human bodies. Um, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, no sin, okay? And we shall be changed, that's the glorification of the human body. For this corruptible, he's referring to the corruptible flesh, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then will be brought to pass the saying which is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So I don't think this verse has got anything to do with going to heaven as a, in a spirit or as a man or whatever. I would certainly believe that when Christians die, if I were to die this moment, okay, my physical body would go into the earth and, yeah. and decay, but my soul or spirit would go to be with Christ in heaven. However, when it comes to Christ, it is quite in the Bible is quite insistent in saying that Christ, he rose from the grave in the same body that he died in. I know Jehovah's Witnesses teach that he he actually rose as a spirit and then he manifested about ten different temporary physical bodies. Uh, I, I read that. It, well, it, it kind of hints at that uh, or yeah, in, well, in, in, for, insight for us, in the scriptures uh, on the when resurrection. We read, when we read accounts where, you know, Jesus' disciples, um, you know, didn't recognize him. Yes, you're going to go to that, the Emmaus that. Road. You're going to go to the Emmaus Road. Could I just give the reference? It's Insight in the Scripture, Volume 2, page 785-786. Now, it says that he appeared in different bodies. Jehovah's Witnesses do not teach that Christ rose as a spirit and then there was one physical body post-resurrection. They teach there was about 10 physical bodies post-resurrection because your insight book says, however, for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples on different occasions in various fleshly bodies just as the angels has appeared to men of ancient times. Like those angels, he had the power to construct and to disintegrate those fleshly bodies, plural, at will, for the purpose of proving visibly that he had been resurrected. So it uses bodies in the plural. So it's saying that Christ rose, according to Jehovah's Witnesses, as far as I understand it, he, he rose from the dead as a spirit creature, and then post-resurrection, he manifested there were probably about 10 different occurrences of Christ appearing to people post-resurrection. So he, yeah. he manifested a different physical body 
for each they don't of those. Have to all be different each time, but yeah. Did you say so they, they would be know, different each time? No, I said they they wouldn't. So as I, as I would understand it, they they wouldn't necessarily have to be different. Is every time Why? you mention ten occasions. Ten different occasions, and your book says he appeared in on different occasions in various fleshly bodies. B o d i e s. That's the plural. So it's implying yeah, so that there wasn't one that's, physical that's body post resurrection. There was a plurality of physical bodies post resurrection in Jehovah's Witness thought. Well, if he had yeah, ten different, fair. if he had ten different um, appearances, and that's a rough guess. I'm not an expert. If he had about ten different. Yeah. Uh, um, appearances post resurrection, then logically, surely that would mean ten different bodies. It, it could, but I, I don't feel there's any need to be dogmatic about that. Um, oh, you, you, you better, because the the resurrection of Christ is the central doctrine of the Christian faith. So it's important that we get this absolutely right. I mean, yeah, do, do, no, you, do, do, do you do you? I'm not talking about the resurrection itself. I'm talking about the. The fact that if there were ten appearances, then that would have to mean that there were ten different bodies. Well, that's not what I believe. Saying. That's that's not what I believe. That's your belief, and it's important that if you're going to say that the Christian Church has been wrong for two thousand years, everyone's wrong, but Jehovah's Witnesses are right. You should know what your belief is, and you should be able to defend it. If you're going to point the finger at the rest of the world and say everyone else is wrong, then you should know what your belief is. I mean, do you no, do you do you believe do, do you believe that when Christ say let's go to the Emmaus Road, when he appeared on the Emmaus Road, uh, what is it? Luke twenty three, isn't it? Was it twenty four? Yeah, I think so. Twenty four. Twenty 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 four. When he appeared on the Emmaus Road, did he stop being a spirit? at the time that he manifested one of these physical bodies? Or was he still a spirit when he manifested this physical body? So, so well, obviously, Jesus, like you said before, you know, Jesus has a spirit when he's resurrected. He, he has a, a spirit, a, a life force, and that life force can be materialized into body so when he's walking along the road then it would be a body that would be slightly different it would be different from his body that he had before he was killed and that's why they struggled to recognize who he was um well it does say that their eyes in, in luke twenty four sixteen. um it does say, but their eyes were restrained, so they did not know him. So it seems that God himself uh, prevented them from, from recognising him. Um, w my question is, when, w when Jesus... Let, let me read it. Luke twenty four thirteen. You believe Christ resurrected as a spirit creature, yes? Yeah. Okay. Luke, Luke... I don't know what that noise is. I was in track for going by, sorry. Oh, OK. Um, Luke twenty four thirteen. Now behold, two of them were travelling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things that had happened. So it was, one they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. It says Jesus himself. Now, is this Jesus the spirit creature? Or has he stopped being a spirit creature? Is he now Jesus the man? Or is he both Jesus the man and Jesus the spirit creature, which would mean that there's two different Jesuses in two different locations? Well, no, because when it talks about in the days of Noah, the, the angels coming down as, as men, it doesn't mean that they created men themselves. Their spirit inhabited physical Body. Right. And so, so, so the same way. So, are you? He's a, right. he's a spirit. Yes. Materializes in a body in in these various occasions. Like I said, I, I don't. I don't believe that uh, that we uh, that we can say that a different body for every occasion 
would be definitely how it happened. You know, some occasions were quite close to each other. So it could be that some occasions were the same body as Jesus was appearing to his apostles. Um, but the fact that Jesus was resurrected in the spirit doesn't mean that he can't have also had a physical form. So you're saying that Jesus resurrected as a spirit and then he manifested these temporary bodies. Your, your book does say the insight in the scripture, bodies are yeah. the plural. However, for 40 days after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples on different occasions in various fleshly bodies. B-O-D-I-E-S. It's a plural. Yeah. So you would be saying that Jesus was a spirit creature and he manifested various temporary bodies at the yeah. same time. So in, in, in this Emmaus account, are you saying that Jesus here is both a spirit creature and he is also a physical body? Or so, what are you saying? Well, I'm saying that he, as a spirit creature, he had the ability to materialize in physical form got in it order to, got it got it I, I i do understand that did he continue being a spirit each time he manifested a physical body or did he stop being a spirit when he manifested the physical body i think you said he earlier on about five minutes ago he still maintained being a, um, a spirit creature each time he manifested the physical body yeah yeah I haven't found that anywhere in your literature. Do you know where your literature says that? Your literature has nothing to say on this at all. And I've, I've gone back to the days of R Russell to try and find something about this. Oh, right. Well, yeah, I, I, can't, I can't sort of think of anything right off the top of my head, but I can try and find something for you if you'd like to, to read it. Um, well, I don't think there is anything. I don't think the Watchtower has ever explained how Jesus can resurrect as a spirit, right? And then he manifests different fleshly bodies on different occasions. What I want to know is, does he stop being a spirit each time he manifests a, f a, f a fleshly body? Does he change from being a spirit creature into a fleshly body each time he manifests a new body? Or does he remain being a spirit creature each time he manifests a fleshly body? Yeah, I've never, yeah. ever seen the Watchtag comment on this. Right, OK. Uh, I mean, you're welcome to give me your opinion, but I'm not really interested in that. What is the official position of the Watchtag? It doesn't have one. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I, I, that, was, that's my understanding. Um... However, I don't have anything, any reference right off the top of my head. Yes, it would be, yes. yes, it would be the official watchtower position that I'm interested in. But certainly on the Emmaus yeah. Road, when it says in Luke twenty four sixteen, but their eyes was, were restrained so that they did not know him. So obviously, um, God himself prevented them from recognizing Jesus until such a time later as it was God's will for Christ to be recognized to them. Yeah, I, I would say that when when it says that their eyes were kept from recognizing him by God, I would say that that, that doesn't by that God doesn't have to. It it's God. Yeah. God God um, kept their eyes from recognizing him because it was His will until later on that it was God's will for for, for them to recognize him. But not at the start. So it's not saying, you can't reason from this, that therefore Jesus was, um, I've had some Jehovah's Witnesses tell me that on the Emmaus Road, he wasn't a physical being. He was a spirit creature and he wasn't manifesting a physical body here. I do tend to think when I've spoken to Jehovah's Witnesses, that I get the feeling they're just kind of making this stuff up, you see. Right, well, what, what I would say, um, in verse 32, of the same chapter. It 
it says at that their eyes were fully opened and they recognised him, but he disappeared from them. So, so think, thinking about that, that the the ability to materialise and then to disappear, um, you know, to to go in to to be removed from physical form to be a spirit and then the disciples say were not our hearts burning within us as he was speaking to us on the road as he was fully opening up the scriptures to us and so there as they as they reflected on what had been taught they realized who it was that it was jesus but you've made an assumption there. You said that Christ was a spirit. You haven't proven that. You've just you've just made that statement. You know, if I say I am a goldfish, no, I'll give you an example. If if I say I am the richest person in the world, I'm far richer than Bill Gates. I would be wonderful if I was, but just saying it doesn't make it true, unfortunately. Yeah. Fair yeah. Point. If you're going to make a statement that Jesus rose as a spirit and he's a spirit creature here, which is what many Jehovah's Witnesses have told me, you need to prove that. Um, remember in a few verses later, in verse 39, Jesus says, behold my hands and my feet. And why did he say such a thing? Obviously because his hands and feet bear the marks of crucifixion. Uh, we find that more, more clearly in John 20, which I'll go to in a moment. And then he says, handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and um, bones as you see I have. So he says, it's, behold my hands and my feet, right, because they bear the marks of crucifixion. It's I myself, so this isn't a ghost, handle me and see, check my hands and my feet to, to see the marks of crucifixion. Then he says, a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you say, I have. So he says very clearly, I am not a spirit. I've resurrected in the same body that I died on the tree in. Anyway, look, thank you. Thank you very much for your time, sir. I do appreciate it.